from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's coming up. Gay State's Jason Bergtold and Calder McCollum will talk about the results of their in-person survey of Kansas farmers about their views on conservation practices and what leads them to adopt or not adopt conservation measures in their crop production. Their findings next. Then K-State's Sarah Lancaster will take a look at the herbicide sensitivity of various winter cover crops. With herbicide carryover from the previous crop being a prime consideration when planting that cover crop this fall. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Raymond Cloyd reporting on current insect activity in home landscapes, including an update on those relentless army worm infestations. All this and more here on Agriculture Today. You are tuned in to Agriculture Today. Welcome once again as we pass along to you still more information, which was conveyed at the recent Risk and Profit Conference hosted by K-State Agricultural Economics a few weeks back now. This particular presentation got into conservation practices on the land and what adopters and non-adopters think about those practices. Very intriguing work right here, and the two authors have joined us now. Jason Berktold is an agricultural economist at K-State, and he is joined by an undergraduate researcher in the department who worked on this as well, Calder McCollum. Jason, let's get right to the objectives and, and purpose behind this research. You really wanted to dig into what producers think about conservation practices, didn't you? Yeah, so we were interested in getting not only the perceptions of adopters, but also people who haven't adopted, who are maybe thinking about it, and trying to find out what were the differences in those perceptions, not just if it's good or bad, but about weed resistance, soil fertility, impacts on crop yields, um, and like net returns and management intensity. And so the idea was, do we find a particular gap between the perceptions of adopters and non-adopters, especially on particular issues, kind of trying to isolate that information and come up with an idea of maybe where future efforts need to focus on providing that education and information, especially to non-adopters yeah. of those practices. What was the methodology here in obtaining the information? Uh, we brought farmers in to do an in-depth workshop on conservation. And during that workshop, we did some extension of training about those. But in addition, asking about their adoption, use of those practices, the impact on their farms, conservation programs, and in particular, looking at these perceptions about these conservation practices. Calder, bring you in. Would you list those conservation practices that you and Jason were interested in finding out more about as far as those perceptions go? Yes, sir. We were looking at four infield conservation practices, as you pointed out, in which case we were talking about continuous no-till. Like we previously said this is meant in terms of the actual conservation practice. And also we had conservation crop rotation as well as cover crops and variable rate technology, meaning that you can apply variable rates of inputs based on infield data in real time. And you dug into each of those specifically with questions about each as far as perceptions go, right? Yes. Um, we were looking at 10 different perceptions, 10 different questions on what did adopters and or non-adopters believe themselves to be affected on weed pressure, uh, insect and disease pressure, soil erosion, soil fertility, management intensity, and as part of that management intensity, the time spent managing the actual crop, uh, the off-site environmental impact, crop yields, production costs, and, of course, net returns. So you were getting into some robust data when yes. it was all said and done yes. here, which was the intent all along. Let's just get right to your findings here and break this down by those particular practices. And what were producers indicating in as far as their take on continuous no-till and their adoption or lack of adoption of that? Right off the bat, uh, you're going to have more adoption in general of the continuous no-till. And in fact, 
of those adopters and non-adopters, there was some differing opinions on uh, weed pressures, insect and disease pressures, soil erosion, crop yields, and of course net returns showed themselves to have the greatest difference. Uh, again, this is perceptions by non-adopters and actual reported data from adopters themselves. And then crop rotations as part of a conservation approach. Same thing. What did you find out there? There was some similarities in uh, net returns and crop yields. You could see from the data that the adopters believed themselves for an increase in net returns, and it was either they didn't know or they thought there might have been a decrease in net returns for the non-adopters. Same sort of perceptions on the crop yields, and in fact, the uh, time spent managing the crop is actually, they showed themselves to be at odds with each other. Interesting how those differ. Yes. And how one would look at something as uh, standard as crop rotation in yes. our farming practices out there. Now, Jason, cover crops have been gaining attention the last several years, although, as you note before we went on the air, they've been around a long time. But you did expressly ask about how producers view that practice and perceive that. Yeah, so cover crops are one of the lowest adopted probably of the conservation practices that we see in field, mm -hmm. kind of really even mixed results from adopters on the perceived crop yield changes. Um, and I think we saw a really even split between having a benefit or actually a yield decrease from even adopters. And so there's even a mixed message on the adoption side, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. And in terms of difference between cover crop adopters and non-adopters, Probably one of the more significant gaps you see with, again, with crop yields and net returns, we see non-adopters perceiving a lower gain than adopters have actually perceived or seen on their land. We also see that there's less of a benefit seen by non-adopters for soil fertility and insect and disease pressures, too. And so pointing out that there may be some issues that aren't coming to light for some of these practices and outreach or they're not being observed. And so that's potential areas for future research or additional education. And the last area, variable rate technology, noting that this is encompassing equipment investment, so that may lend more to this picture. But what did you find out as far as the perceptions on that technology? So variable rate technology was the least adopted of all the conservation practices. And from looking at it as a perspective of a conservation practice, I think we tried to educate from that perspective. The idea would be reduce your input usage on your fields or within field. Again, we saw this split on adopters of seeing the benefit or not seeing the benefit. And there's so much variability on how this is applied or done. As you said, there's investment in equipment, farmers doing it themselves, but there's also a lot of custom work in this area. And so you're kind of relying on someone else to do that. And so seeing that benefit is, there's a big question there in terms of what cost you're paying and um, what you're getting out of it. And so even within the adopters, we, we saw some differences. And surprisingly, I, I think what was interesting here, probably the biggest three areas of difference between adopters and non-adopters was the perceived increase in management time intensity and time managing crops that we saw. And, and then the other two, that net return side again, it's always coming back to that economics and seeing less of a benefit and higher production costs from adopting this by non-adopters compared to adopters. Well, that's a quick glimpse to your results. Once more, there's quite a body of information here. What do you think, Jason, is the main takeaway from this at this point? So I think something that was interesting in this study, and there's probably two big takeaways. I think the first one is we found some significant perception gaps between adopters and non-adopters. And I, I think what's interesting about the group of farmers we surveyed and interviewed, all of them were involved in conservation. So these are not farmers who are not doing conservation. Everyone had some aspect of conservation on their farms. That's who we invited because we were looking at how do we intensify that, that as a goal in these workshops. And so what was interesting, finding these gaps, even for – Farmers who are all – these farmers are conservationists. So it, it raises the question of more broadly in the farming population, 
of farmers across Kansas and, and, and in, in the plains for farmers who are not as deep into conservation, are these gaps even larger? Are we providing that needed information? And is it reaching them? And um, there's a question of how do we effectively do that? I think one of the other things that is very interesting also um, that came out of this, there was a highlight and a common theme across all four practices, obviously, of crop yields, production costs, and net returns, where we see significant perception gaps. The literature and even past research shows it's, it's, it's that economic advantage that you gain in seeing the observed effects on the ground of maybe how we pursue future education and future outreach on these practices and technical assistance, showing that maybe we need to mentor farmer to farmer to provide that management experience and wisdom. Maybe field days need to get deeper into the economics than we do currently. And more than just net returns for that field, but getting deeper into figuring out how do we get farmers that information for their farm more directly. Yeah. Well, the information flow has always been important and uh, even more so indicated by your findings through this rather exhaustive effort on your parts. And this information it was part of the presentation that was given at Risk and Profit Conference. If you'd like to see more about it, you can go to agmanager.info and have a look at the presentation. It's quite revealing, actually, and worth your time, producers. Jason and Calder, thank you very much. Good work. We appreciate the quick overview right here. Thank you. Thank you. Jason Berg told, agricultural economist at K-State, along with undergraduate researcher in the Agricultural Economics Department, Calder McCollum. Perceived perception gaps between adopters and non-adopters of the benefits and the costs of conservation practices. Reporting on it with us here on this part of Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today returns now. We're now entering that part of the fall when many a producer is seriously contemplating planting a winter cover crop as part of their crop rotation and soil health management. Before doing that, though, it is worthwhile to think about the herbicide history on that given piece of ground. And our guest now will remind us why. Sarah Lancaster is a weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. And it should be obvious to producers listening out there, Sarah, but the worry here is about the sensitivity of any given cover crop to whatever herbicide residual remains out there, right? That's right, Eric. You know, we talk a lot about the importance of residual herbicides in terms of season-long weed management of, you know, our most troublesome weeds like Palmer amaranth. <laughs> On the flip side of that coin is the fact that as we think about trying to establish cover crops, it can cause potentially some issues um, if we haven't had conditions that are right in order to make that herbicide break down enough in the soil. And those conditions can vary widely with the chemical we're considering? Well, in general, Eric, the things that you have to have in order to get a herbicide to break down in the soil are a reasonable temperature, um, so above freezing um, for sure, but ideally like room temperature-ish is probably best, and we have to have plenty of moisture. So, you know, there were pockets of Kansas that are pretty dry um, this summer, and so as we think about certainly fall planting of cover crops, that could be something that, that maybe could be a potentially greater problem than normal um, in those areas that were drier than usual this summer. Does the physiology of the given cover crop make a difference too? Sure, Eric. Our herbicides are generally speaking targeted to be active on certain species of weeds, right? So that carries over to the species of cover crops. So, you know, as we sort of think about a lot of the common products that we use and then also think about some of the more common cover crops, you know, really our winter cereals are generally going to be a pretty safe bet you know, there are some situations where you could see reduced stand or maybe some visual crop response, you know, some injury on some of your cover crop, but probably not a total loss. You know, then you could have a conversation. Well, if I'm going to get a stand, what's it matter? Why do I really care? Mm -hmm. But I would counter that with the fact that if we're planting these cover crops with the intent of getting lots of biomass very quickly, if we're slowing that process down, by herbicide carryover, you know, there's some trade-offs there that farmers need to think about in terms of really being able to achieve their objectives with the cover crops, even though it may not be 
you know, a total loss of the stand. If we might, we'll draw from an article on this very topic that you put in the e-update newsletter out of K-State Agronomy recently. It cross-references some of the more popular winter cover crop types with the herbicide classes commonly seen and used out there, herbicide products in corn production prior to this cover crop. As examples, cereal rye, what is it sensitive to? So cereal rye is going to have some sensitivity to things like atrazine or balance, maybe you might have used in your corn. Um, We can also see some issues potentially with Valor or Outlook would be among the more common products um, that we might see a response to. Other things that tend to be safer would be things like Dual or Harness or Zidua tend to be pretty safe um, and have broken down enough by this time that they won't cause an issue. How about wheat as a cover crop now? Not necessarily for grain, but uh, some producers for grazing purposes or otherwise opt in that direction. Yeah, so wheat tends to be a little more sensitive to some of the herbicides than rye. You know, rye is one of the reasons we like cereal rye as a cover crop is because it is so um, hardy um, and can, can come up in some pretty tough conditions. So wheat tends to be a little more sensitive to most of those herbicides that we just mentioned. A legume like red clover, that is also a highly popular cover crop alternative. Yeah, so if you think about it, most of the weeds we're trying to target with a lot of these herbicides are broadleafs, right? So it kind of makes sense intuitively that the broadleaf cover crops would be a little more sensitive to some of these herbicides. So, you know, red clover um, in general is going to be more sensitive to most of the herbicides. Dual is generally pretty safe with red clover. Um, Some things you definitely don't want to try with red clover would be mesotrione or callisto or, you know, products that contain mesotrione. Um, That will be not a good combination for getting a good red clover stand, which can be difficult on its own anyway. So just some things to think about there. Hairy vetch, you know, it's a little larger seeded. It's also a legume, but it's a little larger seeded. And so it tends to have less sensitivity to some of the herbicides. One of the more popular grazing cover crops, radish now, a brassica, what's it sensitive to? Probably the two biggest things to watch out for radish would be balance. So isoxaflutal or, or herbicides that contain that and then sharpen. So those would be a couple of things to really watch out for. But again, being a smaller seeded broadleaf, it tends to have um, sensitivity to a lot of products. About the only thing that the literature suggests are really safe um, would be dual and harness. So products that have metolachlor and acetochlor in them. And I guess before we get away from the table that I put in this e-update article that we're kind of referencing, Eric, when I put this table together... I looked through herbicide labels, which are honestly not very helpful in this regard, (laughs) and the published literature. So the stuff that researchers had done, um, it had been through the peer review process, vetted, and was was out there and available for folks to look at. And so I took a really conservative approach to putting this table together. So if there's a chance at all that you might see some stand reduction, I indicated that. So, you know, really – in the table, there's a, a lot of wiggle room among those those combinations that I have indicated as may cause injury. There is actually another publication um, that was recently developed. So uh, listeners may have heard me talk about the Take Action campaign before. You know, we're super grateful as extension weed scientists that the United Soybean Board has partnered with us to deliver information to farmers about specifically herbicide-resistant weed management. And so cover crops, you know, have a role in that. And so we recently put together a series of publications about managing cover crops. But one of those publications um, is specifically about herbicide persistence and carryover to cover crops. So it's, you know, it's a four-page document. So there's a lot of information in there. There's a much more detailed chart of various herbicide products. And this approach was sort of, unless we know it's going to cause harm, we're going to say it's safe. So this particular publication matches up many more variables that one might want to consider here? Yeah. So, you know, where I had, what, probably eight or 10 different herbicides on my list, Mm -hmm. the Take Action um, publication actually has, I don't know, just glancing at that, probably 30 different herbicides. So how does one access this publication? Probably the easiest thing to do. There's a couple of things to do. One would be to just simply go to your web browser of choice and search for take action cover crop is your kind of keywords in that search. 
Um, so that should take you right to it as one of the top results in your search. The other thing you can do is go to IWillTakeAction.com. And there are a ton of resources there, some of which I've referenced before. But if you go to that website, IWillTakeAction.com, in the top right-hand side of that website, you can search for cover crop, and it will pull up all of the articles related to cover crops, one of which will be this um, herbicide carryover article. That source is rich in information, as Sarah says. IWillTakeAction.com, that's a good place to start, as well as simply searching for online Take Action Cover Crop. But there is one other last aspect of this, but not least, Sarah, and that is knowing what's out there in the way of residual, and you endorse using a field bioassay for that purpose. Yeah, you know, so we talked about the importance of weather variables and determining how much herbicide is going to be left in the soil. And so really, there's two ways to determine that. One is to pull a soil sample and send it to a lab and spend some pretty big bucks and do a lab test and get back a concentration of milligrams of herbicide per kilogram of soil. The other thing that is much more practical and and anybody can do and can do in pretty short order is to do a field bioassay. And so basically all you're doing is planting a test strip, waiting for it to come up, and then looking for any indication of herbicide injury, um, whether that be um, no stand or just those herbicide injury symptoms on the plants that come up. And really, you know, that's the most practical thing that folks can do. It doesn't need to be a big area. It does need to be an area representative of what you're going to plant. I mean, you do need to make sure you know the quality of the seed that you're planting, right? You got to have some indication of the germination and, and such of your cover crop seed. But really, you know, that field bioassay is a super useful tool that probably doesn't get used as much as it could by farmers because it does take time, right? You have to take the time to put it out and you have to take the time to wait for the results. But um, as far as the efficiency and the validity of that compared to pulling samples and sending it off to the lab, if you really have concerns, that field bioassay is probably the better the better option. Well, growers understand the potential for herbicide carryover and how that might impact the performance of that cover crop. Many sources that Sarah has shared with us here. One more would be that Agronomy e-Update newsletter article that she put together on this very topic. It was posted this past Thursday, the 9th of September, and you can find that at agronomy.ksu.edu. Sarah, thank you, as always. Thanks, Eric. Weed Management Specialist Sarah Lancaster, K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today will resume after this break. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network. You are tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and a glance now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy and part of DTN. Despite higher prices, farm income is projected to drop $23 billion in 2022 because of a sharp decline forecast in federal government payments and higher input costs. This according to the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute at the University of Missouri. FAPRI released its latest baseline for U.S. farm income and costs yesterday, projecting 2021 net farm income at 122 billion dollars, the Institute's forecast for 21 higher than the USDA's Economic Research Service. If the numbers hold through the end of the year, net farm income for 21 would be the highest level since 2013. That driven by a sharp increase in sales for crops and livestock, more than offsetting higher production expenses. Now, for 2022, FAPRI is pegging net farm income at $99.3 billion. That's a $23 billion drop, or just shy of 19% down from net farm income for 2021. The difference effectively running parallel to the expected drops in federal subsidies created in response to the pandemic. Total projected government spending on farm-related programs for fiscal 21 comes in at a record $52 billion spending under the C. 
PFAP, pandemic assistance for producers, and the Paycheck Protection Program, all helping drive that higher aid to producers. If policies remain the same, federal aid will drop $30 billion in fiscal 22 down to $22 billion. Now, looking at it from a calendar year perspective, $28 billion in government payments for 21 would drop by $22 billion, down to comparatively low $6 billion in 22, conservation programs making up most of those payments, according to FAPRI. Total cash receipts for sales in major crops and livestock would also decline about $3.3 billion to $427 billion in 22, after seeing a $74 billion spike in cash receipts from 2019 to 2020. Other than cattle and a slight increase in dairy sales, other major commodities are expected to see slight declines in cash receipts. After a price jump in 21, swine cash receipts are expected to see a $3.5 billion drop in value. That's 12%. In that drop. Total cash receipts for 21 expected to drop slightly. Production expenses to increase 3% to an estimated $397 billion. Increases projected for livestock, seed, fertilizer, and chemicals, fuels, and electricity, interest rates, labor, capital, consumption, and rent. Now, even though net farm income is projected at nearly 19% lower for 22, FAPRI is projecting out to 2026, showing their net farm income dropping lower in 2023 to $91 billion, and then some slight increases along the way to 2026. Well, it's been rough sledding economically for dairy producers throughout the pandemic. One leading economist is offering suggestions on how milk pricing and milk marketing orders could be reformed in lieu of the market conditions last year. More on that from the USDA's Rod Bain. In 2020, record negative producer price differentials occurred, which were not just abnormal in magnitude, they were unpredictable and greatly contributed to farm milk price volatility. One reason for a Senate Agriculture Subcommittee hearing Wednesday on milk pricing and possible areas of improvement and reform, and the participation of Cornell University economic professor Christopher Wolf among the panelists. He says those price differentials were caused by a myriad of factors. So when considering improvements to federal milk marketing orders... The entire supply chain from farmers to processors must be healthy for a prosperous dairy industry. The current set of markets and institutions that we have has evolved around the existing federal milk marketing orders system, and the ripple effects of reform should be carefully considered to balance the interests of all involved parties, including equity as well as economic efficiency. He believes that changes over time in production and consumption aspects are leading in part to eventual reforms in the federal milk marketing orders. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And the path is now clear for Canadian Pacific's $31 billion acquisition of Kansas City Southern Railroad to move forward now after Canadian National dropped out of that bidding war yesterday. On we go now to the Kansas soybean update for this week. Here is Greg Akagi. Greg? Amanda Manville is joining us, communication director with Kansas Soybeans and Amanda, the process is still open uh, concerning the Kansas Soybean Commission and request for a proposal process uh, that is going on for projects to be funded. The window is currently open through September 30th for anyone with a research or education project related to soybeans. Anyone interested can submit a proposal for funding from the Kansas Soybean Commission. The current budgeting process is for fiscal year 2023. So the commissioners are looking for innovative projects that would run from July 1 next year through June 30th of 2023 with special arrangements available for projects that require field data to be taken during the course of a growing season. And this is also a process, Amanda, that is very thorough. After the projects roll in, the commissioners will speak in October, look through all that's been sent in and then select a number of the projects that have promised. And then in December, they're meeting December 2nd through 4th. And so all of the selected projects will have an opportunity to present to the commissioners to share a little more about their projects. And then there's a question and answer opportunity. And then the commissioners will talk at length to figure out which projects they feel best fit their priorities for the coming fiscal year. And that's a pretty wide range of projects, too. 
There are a few topics that have been named as areas of interest for the Commission. So projects revolving around innovative best management practices in the field, new technology, livestock and human nutrition utilizing soybeans, new market development and international marketing, plus industrial uses. And the commissioners have also identified some successful projects from recent years as being breeding research that establishes new germplasms and varieties, industry research that brings added value to the price per bushel of soybeans, and so things like biodiesel and soybean meal and feed ration as good research projects that have been successful recently. What is the proper way for them to uh, get their RFP in? If you visit our website at Kansas soybeans.org slash form. There's a section that has all of the forms available. That is Amanda Vanville, Communications Director with Kansas Soybeans, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Thanks, Greg. And we will return shortly here on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today, and for our closing segment, it's to the horticultural scene once more. And a bevy of insect pests yet to talk about in lawn and garden. With us once more is horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd of K-State Research and Extension. Our first topic is prevalent, (laughs) to say the least, Raymond. (laughs) And in fact, it has been topical for weeks now, this onrush of fall armyworms in home lawns and elsewhere. What's the latest on that? Well, Eric, uh, right now, you know, of course, it's a combination. We're looking at probably fall armyworm and armyworm. We went through the first generation. People were seeing these waves of caterpillars eating their turf. And now we've seen lots of adult moths around the area, uh, more so than others. And so we have uh, heard that the second generation of the caterpillars are, is going to be out or is out. Now, the, the extent of the damage, we don't know if it's going to be the same as the first generation, depending on weather, environmental conditions, and natural enemies. But uh, people should be cognizant or aware that the second generation caterpillars will be again feeding on your, your turf grass and you need to take the appropriate measures to deal with it if you think it's necessary. Going back a bit, why again this flood of army worms this year? That's been the question I get all the time, and uh, it was almost like the perfect storm. Now, remember, the armyworms don't overwinter here uh, per se. They, they, get, they get blown up from Texas and Florida and the south. And just the environmental conditions and the jet stream and bringing in lots of adults was just uh, almost like the perfect storm. And this is not unheard of. We've had instances before in Kansas and many other states have reported have been reporting the same thing via the um, the emails we've been receiving from our entomology types of websites. Uh, so it isn't just restricted to Kansas. I think most of the East Coast, the South, and most of the Midwest uh, suffered or experienced uh, a large number of these fall armyworm or armyworms. Then what can folks expect out of this second generation? We've Cool season grasses in the fall. We have new plantings of lawns out there. A big threat from these? It really depends on the extent. That's a good question. People are seeding lawns in September. If the army worms are out there, will they feed upon it? Uh, yes, they will. They just need to uh, either contact their uh, pest management professional or whoever does uh, scouting or spraying and uh, let them know or have them come over and check the situation out. Yeah. They're of such magnitude that uh, professional treatment may be in order, then, you're saying? Well, the professionals can focus directly on that, and I've advised a number of them, and we've seen plots around Manhattan, the heavily infested, and we're monitoring them. They're not treated, monitoring them to see the extent of these infestations. Next year may be nothing. Like most insect populations, they fluctuate. We have high years, and, uh, and then we have low years. Yeah. Let's hope this is a one and done (laughs) in the case of fall army worms in Kansas in lawns, because it's been a whale of a year for those. But other pests are out there, too, Raymond. The redbud leaf folder in redbud trees, presumably. Yeah, eastern redbud, if you've gone out and looked at your tree or shrub of eastern redbud and the leaves are folded over, that's caused by a caterpillar, the redbud leaf folder. And once that happens, there's not much you can do with it because they, that protects them from any type of sprays. 
But this is the time here we see that pretty common throughout Kansas. And so just know what it is. It's the red bud leaf foliar. If you open up those leaves, which are, which are primarily fastened together by white silk and strands, you'll see the, um, uh, the, the caterpillars are very distinct bands of white and black. And uh, they wiggle very vigorously when disturbed. They'll actually come, sometimes fall off plants. But uh, there's really nothing you can do. They don't really cause any major stress or harm to the tree, but it just doesn't look very well. And uh, the trees will eventually drop leaves anyway within a month or so. That's so. right, yeah. So. It's like most of the trees we're dealing with now with some of the other insects. They're really just, just let them cycle out, and it's not really worth interjecting any type of strategy to, to alleviate the problem. All right. Woolly aphids, what do we have here? Yeah, these are a couple inquiries, Eric, on maple trees. Uh, uh, there are a lot of people know what aphids are, but there's a group that they cover themselves with a white, frothy material, and people don't know what it is, but they typically attack oaks and maples. And really, uh, if you can, the easiest way to deal with them is take a high-pressure water spray from your hose and just uh, dislodge them or blast them off, and that usually usually will kill them. They don't normally, in my experience, reach numbers that are going to harm the trees, especially large trees at all, but they are noticeable out there, and people kind of have never seen anything like that, so they kind of question what it is. Yeah, yeah They cause more cosmetic concern than anything else at this point. Yeah, I mean, they're not going to, again, they're not going to directly damage the tree, and they're very easy to deal with, which is a high-pressure water spray, yeah. We like those that are easy to deal with in this case. (laughs) There's yet another pest that you wanted to bring up today, and that is something called the mimosa webworm. Yeah, if people are going out and seeing their honey locusts look like it's been hit with a blowtorch or flamethrower that's brown, that's caused by the mimosa webworm. You can't do anything about it now. Uh, because the folded leaves and the dead tissue is going to be there. Where Plus, like a lot of deciduous trees, they're going to lose their leaves eventually. But we have two generations in Kansas, and this was another banner year for Mimosa Weber in both the first and second generation. But next year, uh, be looking for the little the caterpillars and initial damage on the leaves, and that's when you want to treat, because once the leaves are folded over, uh, really it's almost impossible to get exposure with some type of insecticide at that point, yeah. So looking ahead, about when in the growing season would these make themselves evident to where one might want to treat next year? Yeah, that's a good question, Eric. Of course, it depends on the temperatures, but about May would be a really good time to to look at your trees, and if you start seeing some feeding by the caterpillars, they're green caterpillars, very active, then you might be time to treat them if you want to minimize or alleviate the damage that you're going to see from the feeding. And that is the browning of the, of, of the, the terminals or the tips of the tree branches. Tuck that information away, and if you have honey locusts out there that are looking a little rough right now, it might well be the mimosa webworm. Plan accordingly for control next spring. And as far as extension resources go, you have new publications coming out, you say, Raymond? Yeah, we we have a a new one called Pollinators and Beneficial Insects that just came out. And so people that want information about pollinators and beneficial insects can download that as a PDF or through the uh, Kansas State University bookstore. We also have one on Yonimus scale. It came out earlier. And again, you can inquire on the uh, bookstore at Kansas State University. The newsletter is still coming out. Uh, We'll have an article on uh, uh, redbud leaf folder and some other insects that are out there, such as the goldenrod soldier beetle. So right now, as long as the activity is still there, Eric, the newsletter is still going to come out. Excellent. And take full advantage of all of that information as we are not yet out of the insect activity season in our lawns, in our gardens. Appreciate it as always, Raymond. Many thanks. You're very welcome, Eric. Look forward to our next visit. We'll have you back soon. Raymond Cloyd, horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension for this week's horticulture segment. Well, once again, thanks for tuning in, and we'll be right back here tomorrow this same time. Hope you will be, likewise. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today, over the K-State Radio Network.